and we're ready to go here. I'm getting the thumbs up. So, Bible Church, and thank you for being here on this brisk morning. I don't know about you, but I like brisk. Yeah, some of you are saying yes, and some of you are saying no, I, I like hot. So, well, that's okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. We want to uh, welcome our online viewers. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, all the kind comments that we receive during the week by email and text and other uh, methods. Uh, even people, some people still use snail mail, imagine that. So we really appreciate that and we thank you for it. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer if we could and we'll get started with our study this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the precious name of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus we recognize that everything we are and can be and will be is all because of Him. And we thank You, Father, for loving us so much that You sent our Son, sent Your Son, rather, to die for our sins. And Father, we thank You that uh, this morning You're going to speak. That is my great prayer that You would move me out of the way, that You, Father, would speak through me by the Holy Spirit and that Your people might be encouraged, motivated, convicted, and challenged to live uh, the godly Christian life that you've called us to. And we pray and thank you for these things in Christ's name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if you didn't get a handout, make sure you do. There are plenty of them back there. Just raise your hand and, and Ron will sprint right to you, uh, sort of like the post office, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm using hyperbole this morning. He sprints like I sprint. All right, so this morning I've got to, kind of got to get used to this newfangled system we have here. We have a nice new laptop with a touch screen, so I have to be careful how much I touch it. So let's see here. That worked. There is our outline for this morning. Uh, again, we're going to look at the purpose, aim, and objective here. The title of the message this morning is, Woe is me, for I am ruined. So we'll be looking at Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. You might want to turn in your Bibles to that passage and stand by. Uh, we'll have some general information as we normally do, comments and commentary, and some concluding observations. Uh, here's our purpose again. Why in the world are we taking so much time? Uh, goodness gracious, we're in our 16th session. Can't we get done with this, Pastor Jim? Well, no, we can't because we have a lot more we have to cover yet. It's important because we want to contrast and compare law and grace. Why? Because we need to properly understand these two important themes. There's great confusion in Christendom with regards to uh, how the law applies or doesn't apply to the believer. And so uh, our uh, desire and commitment is to try to present to you a biblical case uh, for why we need to understand that the law is no longer our rule or principle of life. Uh, I've given you these uh, quotes before. I would encourage you on your own time to go back and look at them. I think Schofield has a great comment here about the ministration of the law. William R. Newell, who's also one of my uh, favorite uh, authors, and I encourage you to get his uh, book. You can download it online for free. It's a PDF file, Romans verse by verse. If you just go look for that, Romans verse by verse, uh, you can actually download it to your devices. But again, he has some wonderful comments here about uh, why it's important for us to understand that the, the law is no longer the rule of life for the believer. So let's jump into this this morning. The first thing I want to do, if you've already turned, hopefully, to Isaiah chapter 6, is give you a very, very quick wrap-up of chapter uh, 6 here. There are 13 uh, scriptures, 13 passages here, and uh, let's look at this. So we're going to take the 30,000 foot view here. Verses 1 through 5 are going to be our focus this morning, and it's important that I tell you, you know, I'm sorry to tell you this this morning, but this is going to be the last Old Testament passage that we're going to be specifically focusing on in the Law and Grace series. So, our Old Testament focus ends today in this session. So now what do we do, right? The next question is, well, oh goodness gracious, I guess we're done. No, we're going to keep going, and the question might be, if we're finished with the Old Testament scriptures, where are we going next? Can anybody guess? 
we're going to go into the New Testament. That's going to be our focus. And so in our next uh, session, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. So stay tuned for that. So let's see here. In Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, or rather 1 through 7, Isaiah records his vision or his visit to heaven, vision visit, right? It is, if you will, his vision into heaven's throne room. Then in verse 8, we, as it were, become spectators of the Lord's commissioning of Isaiah when he commissions him to speak to Judah on his behalf. So that's what's happening here in verses 1 through 8. I'm still trying to get used to the touch over here. It's my touch screen, so bear with me. There it goes. So that's the next one. In verses 9 through 10, here's our 30,000 foot view again. We find a description of the spiritual heart disease which kept the people of Judah from hearing, heeding, and responding to Isaiah's message. And then, in verses, finally, verses 11 through 13, well, there, I'm a little behind, aren't I? All right, I'm going to get this straight in a second. All right. In verses 11 through 13, they record the imminent external political and military conditions coming upon Judah and the land surrounding it. And that's the quick overview of chapter 1. So for the remainder of our time in this session, We're going to be mining out the treasures that we're going to find in verses 1 through 5. So one of the first things we might want to ask is, who is Isaiah? Probably most of us are familiar with Isaiah. We're probably very familiar with some of the more well-known passages. Who is this fellow Isaiah? Well, he is a Hebrew holy man, and uh, there's no doubt about that. We might could even argue that Isaiah is a great Hebrew holy man. Uh, He was a court prophet for several kings of Judah. For example, if we look over here in Isaiah 1.1, we see that the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of, here they are, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So, uh, he was an important fellow, wasn't he? According to Jewish tradition, Isaiah lived on into the time of Hezekiah's son, and who would that be? That was Manasseh, and that and that's ultimately is recorded in part in extra-biblical Jewish writings that, that Manasseh actually murdered Isaiah, And he did this by having him sawn into alive. Isn't that interesting? We find this, in fact, over here in Hebrews 11, 36 through 40, we believe that this is the illusion that's being made when it says, it's talking about, you know, this is the hall of faith, right? By faith, others experienced mockings and scourgings. Now, previous to this, uh, he had listed all of the very good uh, word of faith stuff that people believe. You know, everything was positive, 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 you know, nothing negative. And unfortunately, the whole word faith movement and the prosperity people and all, they stop at that section, right? They don't ever go down to verse 36 and continue reading because look at this. The same people that by faith were delivered and had all these wonderful things happening in their life, let's see what happened to some of the other folks. By faith, others experienced what? Mockings and scourgings. Yes, and also chains and imprisonment. Woohoo! I'm up for that. How about you? Yeah? They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And look what God's assessment of these individuals is. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Isn't that something? They were wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground and all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us and who are the us? Point at yourself. 
right? Yeah, we're included in this because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Wow. So, sawn in two. Let me read to you what I discovered in the, uh, in the Jerusalem Talmud. This is what they record about Isaiah. They say this, that Isaiah, fearing King Manasseh, hid himself in a cedar tree. But his presence was betrayed by the fringes of his garment. And King Manasseh caused the tree to be sawn in half. Wow, what a great faith thing, right? You ready for that? Wow. Well, apparently, as I said, that's what is alluded to here in verse 37. Again, who is Isaiah? He's a Hebrew holy man. And he is also a man whose children's names, there we go, whose children's names were used of God. In fact, his children's names were deliberately given to him by God as a part of his ministry. And we find that in chapters 7 and 8, and, and God gives the names, and then he also explains the reasons for that. Look at here, Isaiah 7, 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, you ready for this? Shear Jashub, which literally means a remnant shall return. And you're going to go out and you're going to go to the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Then in verse, uh, chapter 8 rather, the Lord said to me, Take for yourself a large tablet and write on it in ordinary letters, Swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. And that is the uh, actual literal translation of his second son. Uh, I just love this. We should all name our children like this, right? Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Wow. I wonder what he called him for a nickname. He needed a nickname, didn't he? All right. He is a holy man, as we said. But what else? Here's some Bible trivia for you. Isaiah was the chosen author of 66 chapters of inspired scripture. I think that it's rather interesting to note that he wrote 66 chapters and there are 66 books in the Bible. And we know that there are 39 Old Testament books in the Bible. And the last is what? It's that Italian book, Malachi. No, 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 Malachi, I'm sorry. The very next book after Malachi is what? Matthew. So Matthew is the 40th book of the Bible, and that's where we begin the New Testament. I think it's very interesting that if you go to Isaiah chapter 40, you begin to encounter New Testament themes. Just coincidence, I'm sure, right? So now we must remember very important that we understand I'm sorry I keep forgetting that I'm supposed to do this okay it's important that we remember that Isaiah lived and carried out his ministry at the time when the Mosaic law was the rule of life when we begin this when we began this law and grace series one of the key points that I emphasized and I have done so over and over again was the fact that the children of Israel were baptized into Moses. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, which we have here. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So the children of Israel, including Isaiah, were all baptized into Moses and were all living under the law of Moses as a binding, burdensome rule of life. Dr. Constable here has a wonderful quote uh, talking about what this idea of baptism means here. And he says, baptism is the outward expression of the believer's identification with the object of his or her faith. Consequently, Paul could say the Israelites were baptized into Moses, watch this, even though they did not undergo literal water baptism in the name of Moses. 
By following Moses and submitting to his authority, they expressed their identification with him. I like what Newell has to say here also, referring to this very same verse. He says uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.2, we read, uh, we read that the fathers of Israel were all baptized unto Moses. He says those Israelites were indeed judicially associated by God with the Mosaic economy into a spiritual union with Moses and constituted his disciples. I happen to have the link there, and you should have that in your handout also, if you would like to go download that PDF again, Romans verse by verse. There's Romans 5, 20 through 21. Well, let me back up just for a second here. By contrast, now we talked about baptism, they are baptized into Moses. By contrast, we in the church are baptized into whom? Into Christ, right? Jesus Christ. And we see that in Romans 3.27 and Romans 6.3. And so we are living under the, what's called the new creature rule. Uh, George Zeller, who is associate pastor at Middletown Bible Church, notes the following. I really like what he says here. We are new creatures in Christ by the grace of God and totally apart from any works of the law. By faith, we are to reckon on the fact that we are new creatures in Jesus Christ, united with him in a wondrous union partaking in his death, and partaking in his resurrection life. By faith, we are to reckon upon what God has already accomplished at the cross. And we see that in Romans 6. Now, on to Romans 5, 20 and 21. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5 says that grace is now the reigning principle, reigning through righteousness. It is the reigning principle in the life of the believer. I have a chart right here. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, I've, what I've done here is I've break, broken this down so you can see. First of all, we have our federal headship. There's federal headship in Adam, the whole race, right? And then in Christ. What is the reigning principle under those individuals? As an unbeliever, your reigning principle is death through sin. But under Christ, your reigning principle is grace. Isn't that wonderful? Then we look at the, the law. What do we have here? So we have the stewardship here. Who is the steward of the law? Moses. What is the rule of life? It is the law. What about under Christ? As, the, as we're being, living under this reigning principle of grace, Christ is the steward of that, and he's also the steward of the new creature rule that we live under. And I love this. Whose works are involved in this process? Under the law, it's your works. It's my works. And oh, oh, gee, I just hope I do good enough, right? But what about, what do we see with Christ as a believer? Whose works are we concerned about? Is it our own? Do our own works get us into Christ? No. It's Jesus Christ and Him alone, and we should all be shouting right now. Praise God. I don't know about you, but no matter how hard I try, it just isn't good enough. And thank God I know that. Because then I can rely by faith in Christ's work and what He has done, right? I can yield my, my members as instruments of righteousness. What's the key word in that? Yield. I yield, right? I let Him live His life through me. Amen? I believe it. What's the people group? Well, the law is directed, as we've said, to Israel, but in, in Christ, we, in, the people group is the church, right? It's not Israel. It's made up of all peoples. If you're under the law, it's because you've been baptized into Moses, but if you're a believer, it's because you've been baptized into Christ. And you see the ministry characteristics we've talked about before. If I'm going to live under the law, 
I have a sentence of death if I don't keep the law absolutely perfectly. But under Christ, what is the ministry characteristic? Righteousness. Because of what Christ has done. And then the nature of our blessings. Well, if you're under the law, it's always an if. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you if. But under Christ, under grace, we have an unconditional promise of eternal life and eternal blessings, and they're heavenly. Uh, what, what, how do we deal with earthly difficulties under the law? Well, we have to be concerned because, as I've said, if we don't perfectly live out every tenet of the law, how many, by the way, how many laws were there? Somebody help me here. 613, okay? Let me hear you quote off the first 25. Go. Right? Oh, you can't quite do that, can you? But can you imagine you just break one? And you're under the death condemnation of death, and you have curses for disobedience, right? But under Christ, what, are the, what is God, or how does God use earthly difficulties in our life when we're in Christ? When we're under grace, He uses them for growth and or discipline. Isn't that wonderful? I'm so glad that God loves me enough that He doesn't leave me to my own devices. How about you? Amen. I like it. Thank you for thank you for Amen in that. Let's move on here. <clears throat> Isaiah 42 says, The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to make the law great and glorious. Now, who's saying this? Who, who's writing this? Isaiah, right? Same guy we're talking about this morning. He says, This law, it's great and glorious. And he says, he, God gave Jacob up for a spoil and Israel to plunders. Who did it? God did it. Why? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? and whose ways they were not willing to walk, and whose law they did not obey. Wow. Verse 21, the Lord who himself wrote the law is also the one who designed that it should be great and glorious. When I say great and glorious, you should be getting an image of the lessons we did on the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Do you remember what we talked about? The earthquakes, the thunder, the lightning, the smoke, the glory of the Lord, all these things that were transpiring. Wow. In fact, in Romans seven twelve, the law is actually called good, righteous, and holy. We've said before, there's nothing wrong with the law. The problem is us. We don't have the capacity to keep the law. But notice what Isaiah writes in verse 24 regarding the failure of Israel to keep the law. He gave it to them but they couldn't keep it. In whose ways they were not willing to walk. What's the key word you hear in that? Not willing. They weren't even willing to do it. And whose law was it that they didn't obey? It was God's law. God gave the Mosaic law to the Israelites, but they were not willing to walk in it, and they rebelled against it. Let's look at our passage now. Isaiah 6, 1 through 5. And we're going to dive in here as quickly as we can and mine some good treasure this morning. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips." For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. As we come to this passage this morning, we have a few questions that we want to consider. Question number one. Coming from the place as God's own chosen mouthpiece to the people of Israel, that would be Judah here in this case, here's the question. How does Isaiah respond to the realization that he is seeing God. Does Isaiah take kind of a nonchalant, casual, relaxed attitude? 
Does he just sort of mosey on up to God and say, Hey God, this is a really nice opportunity to chat with you. Does he say, God, this is just so cool. How about I just hang with you? Right? Is that Isaiah's response? Question number two. As a man who's writing divinely inspired scripture and knows that the Holy Spirit is working through him, how comfortable does Isaiah seem to be with the idea that he is right there in heaven with the one awesome, holy God? Think about that. Question number three. Does the rule of law equip Isaiah to be in God's presence? These are some questions that we want to keep before us as we consider the passage this morning. So we're going to be thinking about that. So first of all, let's talk about this. In the year uh, of King Uzziah's death, verse 1, Isaiah 6.1 gives us a date and time of sorts uh, for Isaiah's writing by identifying who was the king at the time. And that is Uzziah, also known as Azariah. You can find that in 2 Kings 15. Uzziah the king died in 740 B.C. after reigning 52 years. He had been the most powerful king in Jerusalem since the time of Solomon, almost two centuries before. Uzziah was both a powerful and a good king up to this point in time, and with the exception of one faux pas, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. An interesting bit of information is that directly across from the temple was the Mount of Olives, of course we know that, where Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse, and also where Jesus ascended into heaven. Right there on that very same mount, this burial plaque that I have pictured was found, which says, Here the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah, were brought. Do not open. So was Isaiah, or Uzziah, what's his name? Uzziah. Was Uzziah a real person? You betcha he was. But King Uzziah, in the last year of his reign, again 740 B.C., died a leper. Why did this happen? It happened because he became proud. He decided that being the king was not enough. He also wanted to be a priest, even though he was not of the tribe of Levi. And it is interesting to note that the Davidic kings were, in fact, permitted to offer sacrifices on the bronze altar in the temple courtyard. And they were permitted to enter the temple. So that wasn't the problem. However, the Mosaic law was very, very clear, very specific, and only permitted that the priests could offer incense in the temple. Look at 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 21 here. This talks about what happened. What what did did Uzziah get in his head here? Well, here we go. When he became strong, and what this is referring to is when when the kingdom was powerful and all their enemies were submitted. That's what this is talking about. His heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, it says. And he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Well, what was the response to that? Then Azariah, the priest, entered after him with 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. That's an interesting word. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord God. And of course, we know at that point, Uzziah did a little self-assessment. Oh yeah, I've really blown it here. No, that's not what happened. 
But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand for burning incense, what happened here? What do you see here? He was enraged. Enraged. He wasn't just angry. He wasn't just mad. He, just, he wasn't just put off a little bit or put out, right? He was enraged. He was enraged. And while he was enraged with the priest, the leprosy broke out. And it broke out on his forehead before the priests, in the house of the Lord, beside the altar of incense. Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead. And they hurried him out of there, and he himself also hastened to get out. You think he would do that? Yeah. He hastened too uh, to get out because the Lord had smitten him. And look what happened here. King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, And he lived in a separate house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. So Uzziah arrogantly goes into the temple, but he's in the wrong place, at the wrong time, from the wrong lineage, attempting to do the wrong job. So Azariah, with 80 valiant priests, why do you think it calls them valiant you think it might be a little problem with opposing a king, right? Maybe it might be a little, little repercussions possibly there. These guys were valiant because they didn't even think about that. They were going to honor God and not man. So it says, 80 valiant priests, they do what? They thwart his efforts to burn incense on the altar of incense. And the result was that he could no longer, this is Uzziah now, because of his disobedience, he could no longer enjoy personal worship at the temple. And he was no longer allowed in his own palace. Wow. He had to, in fact, share rulership with his son Jotham, who was placed over the king's house and who himself, that is Jotham, became the judge over the people of the land. Whose job was that supposed to be? That was Uzziah's job. So here we have a picture of a great king. Up to this point in time, he'd been fabulous. But now we have a great king who has disgraced himself terribly. The next phrase in Isaiah 1, I hope you're looking at that, says, Isaiah says Isaiah, Uzziah says, I saw the Lord. Isaiah only briefly describes the vision of Yahweh, but he identifies him as the sovereign Lord. That's the the Hebrew here. uh, Then Isaiah describes God as seated on his throne. And look at the description. He's lofty and exalted. And this is suggesting his great, great, great authority and his awesome, awesome, awesomeness. He says, I saw the Lord. To try to give you some point of reference to what Isaiah describes, I'm going to give you a little story. And here's the story. It's the story of a renowned, skilled mountain climber in Europe. And this fellow had mastered the Alps. So while on his first trip to the Himalayas, upon seeing the initial range of mountains, he remarked to the local guide next to him how amazing they were. Look at those, look at those mountains right there. Wow. And he asked the guide and the locals, you know, well, what are these called? And the response was that there wasn't a name for them because they were just foothills. Just foothills. Isaiah no doubt had this kind of an experience here. There was a grandness and an exaltation and a loftiness to what he experienced and viewed in that vision or as he was transported, as it were. The Lord's great authority is awesomely evident. You know, uh, Isaiah came from the priestly family, so he had access to the temple. He got to see all the glorious things that God had done in constructing the temple. But that was just the foothills. Now he was in the Himalayas. Big, big difference. That's what he saw. He started out here. Isn't that pretty? 
But then he saw the real thing. I saw the Lord. Wow. God has a filling and majestic presence in this overwhelming heavenly scene. And Isaiah describes it saying that the train of his robe filled the heavenly temple with his glory. Notice that Isaiah doesn't have to have an angel tell him where God is. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah himself sees and declares, I saw the Lord. He himself sees the grandness and the majesty. And guess what? He doesn't have any questions about which of these heavenly beings is God. Similarly, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be asking, where's God? Right? I wonder where He is. We won't be looking for signs or directions to locate Him. His presence will be seen and felt everywhere in heaven. And we will, for the first time, have an unobstructed perception of who He is. Wow, are you ready for that? As, the, as they say, are you ready for that? I, I can't wait. I just can't wait. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea of this train. What does he mean when he says the train filled the temple? Did he mean something like this? Was there a heavenly railroad system? Well, I'm just checking to see if you're awake and paying attention. But since I have it up there, do you, do you like my locomotive? Did you notice the Israeli flag on the back? Trailing off the back there? I mean, after all, we do have to have a little fun sometimes, don't we? Yeah. So, obviously, that's not what he meant. So, what did he mean by a train? A special train or him on a robe in Isaiah's time indicated a position of high honor and respect, such as that for a king or a priest. Longer hymns uh, and also long tassels also meant great and awesome power. Robes of important persons were often made of purple fabric. And it's interesting to note that the purple dye that was used for, the cost, for these garments was costlier per ounce than gold in those days. Wow. So these robes also often had ornamental bells, and were made from precious, which were made from precious metals, and they would be attached to them. So the more attachments and the longer the robe or trains communicated awesome power. If you've ever seen in the past, if you're old enough, if you've ever seen the coronation of a king or a queen, what's one thing you notice about it? They've got this train going back behind them, and it takes 45 people to be able to carry it with them, right? Big, long train. That, the whole purpose of that is to emphasize their authority, their power, and their honor. So to have the train or hem of the, uh, of the uh, garment uh, uh, of the Lord here, uh, describing His train, to have that train or hem so large now as to fill the temple with His glory speaks of the immensity and the extent of His glory. The fact that the train or hem of the Lord's robe filled the temple with His glory conveys the ultimate holiness and the overwhelming power of the Lord. Then the next thing it says is that the seraphim stood above Him. Verse 2 says that the seraphim stood above Him, meaning who? God, right? And the Hebrew word here is transliterated seraphim in our Bibles. It literally means burning ones. And interestingly, Isaiah 6.2 is the only passage in the Bible that provides a clear description of these beings using the title seraphim. Seraphim is a classification of angel, and it's not the only one. In fact, the Bible indicates that there are three and perhaps four specific orders of celestial beings. Angels, general, seraphim, and cherubim, 
but we also have this idea of living beings. Uh, this artist's depiction, I like this a lot because the artist did a pretty good job of showing the six wings and their position as is described in Isaiah 6 2. So the Hebrew word here, seraphim, it ends in I am, and you probably already know this, but for the, the, uh, those who may, might not know, I am on a Hebrew noun indicates plurality. So this says here, the seraphim, it's indicating plurality, but notice that in the verse, it says this, it's the singular form of the verb, seraphim, which, means, which is seraph, meaning burning one. Interesting. So this one seraph is described as having two wings to cover his face, two wings to cover his feet, and two wings to fly. Now, you and I, we would probably naturally be thinking that if you've got six wings, you're going to use all those to fly, right? You just go that much faster, get that much higher, right? That's not the case here. It's very interesting if we notice what's happening here. One pair of wings is used to fly. But notice that the remaining four wings are used for concealment. Very interesting. We don't have time to go over this whole chart, and I know the print is very small, but you have a copy of it. And, and by the way, the PowerPoint presentation is downloadable if you'd like to get that chart. But I think it's very interesting that, there is, that we can do a comparison of the living beings of Revelation 4 to similar beings from I, uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah here. And of course, we're, what are we teaching on Sunday mornings in the main service when pastors here? Revelation. So maybe this is kind of pertinent to the discussion. Right, so we have the living beings. Notice up there, if you, hopefully you can see that. Uh, and it says that, that where are the living beings? They're in the midst of and around the throne. Where are the seraphim over on the far right? They're above the throne. Drop down there, it says, verse 8, six wings full of eyes and within. And then look back over under the seraphim. What do they have? They also have six wings. And isn't it interesting that the living beings and the seraphim have a similar role? Look at this. What do they do? They cry, holy, 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 Lord God of Almighty, that's the living beings. And then you see the same, similar type thing over here for the seraphim. Holy, 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 Lord of hosts. Kind of interesting. Similar, uh, similar responsibilities there, aren't there? Um, that's my chart. And uh, let's see. Again, I'll let you investigate that on your own. I think it's kind of fascinating. The next phrase is one called out. Now this goes back to what I was saying a minute ago. One called out. So there were seraphim all around, but one of them now is the focus. In verse 3 here, it says one called out. So what we see here in the rest of verse 3 and on into verse 4 is the impact of the voice of just one seraph. Just one. This impact is on the heavenly scene. This great and grand and majestic place that Isaiah has been called to either in the form of a vision or perhaps even by means of a visitation, not unlike to that to which the Apostle Paul experienced in 2 Corinthians 12.1. We don't really know. Was, was Isaiah caught up into heaven uh, or was this just a vision? In any case, it was a significant uh, event in his life. What is insightful about the verse here, verse 3 and on into verse 4, is number one, what the seraph said but also the great magnitude of the power with which this single seraph spoke. One seraph speaks, and there is astounding power demonstrated in his words. Now, I might, might give you a little insight into what's ahead in Revelations. You may or may not know this, but I think it's very interesting that when it talks about the fact that this, this angel speaks with a loud voice, in the book of Revelation, there are at least 20 times where a loud voice or loud voices are mentioned, and almost always that's in reference to angels. So when an angel speaks, you know, it's kind of like E.F. Hutton. When the angel speaks, you better listen, right? And the reason that they use a loud voice is, of course, to be emphatic. So if we look here, holy, holy, holy is the next thing that the seraph says. And why is it that the seraph doesn't just say holy and get on with his message? Why does he say holy, holy, holy? 
Well, it's kind of interesting. In the Hebrew language, one way to emphasize or to stress something is to repeat it. And for example, I've listed up here for you Isaiah 26.3, which we're probably familiar with. Look, look what it says. The steadfast of mine you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Well, in, in actuality, the Hebrew text doesn't actually say perfect peace. It literally says peace, peace. And this is done in order to emphasize the extreme character of God's peace. So when we see holy, 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 Isaiah is emphasizing the character of God's holiness. It is perfectly, perfectly holy. He's emphasizing the extreme holiness of God. We can't even really fathom and understand what that means yet, but we will one day. To repeat something twice would normally be sufficient to make emphasis, but to say it three times goes beyond that. In fact, it's extraordinary emphasis. Extraordinary emphasis. So God is the ultimate, and He is unmatched in His quality and magnitude of holiness. There is no other standard of holiness. He is the standard by which all holiness is compared. It's interesting also to note that this is the only place in the Old Testament where this particular phrase is used. This phrase is also used one time only in the New Testament in Revelation 4.8. And in both instances, it's spoken by a six-winged six -winged angelic being in heaven. Just coincidence, I'm sure. Uh, it's almost as if that specific angelic being alone has been given that assignment, perhaps. Something to think about. Let me back up again here. Lord of hosts, uh, let's see, yeah, Lord of hosts. This title uh, for the Lord, this is interesting trivia, never shows up from Genesis through Judges. You never see Lord of hosts. However, the prophets, when they come on the scene, and they're speaking for and from God, because they're wanting their audience to understand who the Lord is, they use this expression liberally. All the way from 1 Samuel through the rest of the Old Testament. And guess what? They use it some 230 times. And 50 of those times is found in the book of Isaiah alone. The Lord of hosts is the creator of all the hosts of heaven. What this refers to is the innumerable, countless number of angelic beings. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John, upon seeing the heavenly scene in a somewhat similar manner to Isaiah, describes them as myriads of angels. And myriad is equivalent to 10,000, which is the largest number in Greek. It was roughly equivalent to saying countless so how does John describe the number of angels? He says myriads of myriads, countless numbers of countless numbers. That's what Isaiah is saying here also. This phrase, Lord of hosts, refers to the Lord who created this awesome, phenomenal number of angels. And yet, watch this, each one is unique. They're an individual. And within those unique individuals are unique categories. And with unique, the, each one has a unique and different role. He's a fabulous God, isn't he? God is the Lord of hosts, and he has charge over all of them. That, in fact, is the picture that Isaiah is painting for us here. The next phrase, the whole earth is full of his glory. Now what happens is Isaiah changes scenes. So he's talking about heaven, now he's talking about earth. The whole earth is full of His glory, right? And watch this. This phrase is consistent. This phrase is consistent with the full breath of God's eternal purpose. And what do we mean by God's eternal purpose? It's to declare and to reveal and to share His glory such that He Himself will be glorified forever and ever. God declares and reveals and shares His glory with us, both on an astronomical scale 
and also on a scale that includes even the tiniest details. All so that we can relate to His glory. The whole earth is full of His glory. Numbers 14, 21 declares that all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. From the microscopic scale to the grand astronomical scale of creation, what do we mean when we say glory? And again, it is the radiant essence of who God is. Then it says the foundations of the thresholds trembled. This is interesting. Now, what caused this to happen? One seraph. When this one seraph shouted out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. There was, to borrow a line from the Jerry Lee Lewis song, a whole lot of shaking going on. Yeah, you got to listen, right? Yeah, the Hebrew phrase used here refers to the massive stone gate and post constructions that were used in city gates in Isaiah's time. In this instance, the King James Version actually is closer to the Hebrew text. It says the posts of the door moved. To give you an idea of what this phrase really means, I have for you here an insert picture of Dr. Bryant G. Wood showing the gate post base socket found at what is believed to be the city of Ai. In constructing these structures, the builders would take a massive rock and set it in place. This would become the base of the gate structure. Then they would grind out an indentation in it, and I think you can see that in the picture, into which they would then set heavy posts. This socket would serve as the pivot point for the gate. The entire gate structure was amazingly firm and solid, and it had to be. Why? Because in the event of an attack, you want something substantial in place to keep the enemy out. So this is the idea. Here's this solid structure that isn't supposed to move, and at the voice of one seraph, it all starts shaking. Isn't that wonderful? So this is the idea conveyed by the Hebrew. And again, who made this gate, post, and socket assembly shake? It was not the seraphim. It was not the Lord's voice. It was the voice of a single seraph. Then the next phrase says, The temple was filling with smoke. Exodus 40, 30-34 and Revelation 15, 8 have something similar uh, and that is, there's also the smoke associated with the tabernacle in the wilderness and the heavenly temple. And uh, what does that smoke represent? It represents the glory of God. There are the passages for you. I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see there. The glory is associated with the cloud in Exodus and associated with the smoke in Revelation. Now, what is Isaiah's response to this calming, soothing situation that he's just encountered, right? What is his response? He's seeing God's majestic, awesome character. He's seeing heavenly beings whom God has created. He's hearing the voice of a single seraph, which causes the foundations of the threshold of the heavenly temple to shake and rock. And all the while, the heavenly temple is filling with glorious smoke. What does he say? He says, woe is me, for I am ruined. This is the very first, let me move that over. This is the very first thing that Isaiah observes about himself. Up to this point, everything has been about God and the seraphim and the heavenly realm. Now, when Isaiah finally realizes who he is as compared to who God is, he says that he is ruined. No amount of reading and studying and writing about the law, no amount of service over the years as God's mouthpiece could prepare him for this moment. Isaiah's character is no match for God's absolute holiness. There is, in fact, only one appropriate response. I am ruined. 
In chapter 5, Isaiah had pronounced six woes on the people of Judah. Now, he pronounced a seventh woe upon himself. The Hebrew word translated ruined literally means to cut off or destroy. So basically what Isaiah is saying when he sees all this is, this is the end of me. This is it. I'm done. Isaiah is seeing himself in what I'm going to call terminal trouble. He's saying, I cannot hope to approach God's awesome, phenomenal, spectacular, majestic holiness. I'm ruined, he says. He explains why in the next three lines, and it's only the beginning of the list, but that's all it takes. Look what he says here. He says, first of all, that he himself is a man of unclean lips. Then he says, I live among a people of unclean lips. And guess what? It just takes one word to become defiled. And finally, he says, what? That he has seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Let's make some concluding remarks here in the time we have remaining. I'll try to go as quick as I can. Let's make some comparisons here. Paul tells the believers in the church of Ephesus that they are seated and enthroned with Christ. And where is that happening? It's in the very place that Isaiah has just described. They are seated and enthroned with Christ, these Ephesians, he says, who is himself seated at the right hand of God the Father. Notice that the Apostle Paul doesn't say that he alone is seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Rather, he says that you and I, as believers in Christ, are also seated there with Christ in the heavenlies. All church-age believers, in fact, are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And this is the place that when Isaiah saw it, he says, Woe is me, I'm ruined. The Apostle Paul even tells them that they have confident, they have confident access to God, these Ephesians. They have confident access. He even says that they can approach God and call Him Abba. Oh, oops, no. Well, not to be confused with the mega group Abba. Sorry about that. This Aramaic word is basically a term of endearment equivalent to saying Papa. The Apostle Paul uses both the Aramaic and the Greek highlighting the believer's intimate relationship with God. Do you feel like you have an intimate relationship with God? I hope so. Here are some other verses that I have listed that show, that, that actually say what we've just said here about our confident access and how we can call God Abba Father. Ephesians, Romans 8, Galatians 4 there. Notice that there's no fear or anger or displeasure or disappointment in our intimate relationship with the Father. In fact, we are, uh, as we are diligent to apply 1 John 1, 9 in our lives, we know that we can always have confidence before God. Isn't that right? If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous to, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And once we've done that, it says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Isn't that wonderful? Isaiah was not in Christ, but we are. He, like the rest of the nation of Israel, was baptized into Moses and identified with the law and therefore under the rule of law. But we have been baptized into Christ. This word baptized is very interesting. One of the ways it was used is to describe the quenching process of metal. And so that's what I'm trying to show you up here in the picture from the left to the right. If we're making a sword or a knife in the far left picture, we would heat it to soften the metal. And then we would pound it into the shape we wanted. Then in order to harden the steel, we would get the metal white hot, pull it from the fire, and immediately plunge the sword or knife into a container filled with water or oil. So that's what you see in the middle picture. Once this was done, the sword or knife would hold an edge and resist nicks and dulling, now watch this, because the metal was radically and permanently changed through the process of being fully immersed or baptized. 
If you've never seen this process, there's a show called Forged in Fire on the History Channel. I don't normally recommend the History Channel, but that's a pretty good show. Yeah, and you might want to investigate that. This is what is meant by water baptism for the believer. It is an outward symbol of the radical, permanent, internal spiritual change that occurred at the very moment of faith. When we speak then of being baptized into Moses or Christ, we are referring to a similar spiritual change, but also a fuller meaning. And that is that the Israelites were identified with Moses and therefore placed under the law, and we were identified with Christ and placed under grace. Isaiah was concerned that he might die. As a matter of fact, when he said, I'm ruined, he was actually making the declaration, I'm going to die. But we who are in Christ have already died. And what do I mean by that? We have been identified with Christ in his death. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that we have been baptized into Christ, that is, placed into him, such that we share his spiritual history. The first part of our shared spiritual history is our identification with Christ in his death. But that's not all. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. We ascended with him. And we were seated with him. And we take it all by faith because that's what God's word says. Isaiah was not seated in the heavenlies, but we are. Isaiah was commissioned and sent back to live among his people the people of Judah, those people who had unclean lips that he talked about. Isaiah was commissioned and sent back. When the Apostle Paul talks about our seating with Christ, he doesn't mean that someday we're going to get to heaven. That's not what he's saying. What he's talking about is our right now positional seating with Christ in the heavenlies. We remain positionally seated with Christ And he now does the living here, going back among the people in and through us. It's Christ's job to do the living here and to accomplish his purposes while we do our living in the heavenlies. He does the living here as we yield our bodies as living sacrifices to him. The power and the glory of the holiness of the Lord as he was sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted as Isaiah described, Conveyed by the robe and the glory that filled the temple and the smoke that was described there. The power, the glory, and the holiness of the Father shares with us. For Isaiah, the heavenlies were a world and a place apart. For us, it is our home because we are in Christ and we are seated with Him. We in the body of Christ, rather than seeing, that, seeing heaven as the place of our undoing, See it as the place of our heart's home and the place where we have our citizenship. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of what He has done. Rather than being aghast at having seen the Lord as Isaiah was, we are invited to behold the the glory of the Lord even now until the day that we see Him. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That mirror refers to the Word of God. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So I have a question. Do we look forward to being with the Lord in heaven and having a new glorified body? You betcha. Yes, of course we do. But we don't close up shop and just wait for that to happen. We are invited to behold the glory of the Lord right now, moment by moment. Isaiah, 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says here, Beloved, now we are children of God and has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And notice what the last verse says there, verse 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Isaiah saw the Lord and was terrified to the point of death. But there will come a day when we will see the Lord and we will say, wow, wow, the Lord has made me just like himself. 
We will see Him just as He is, and we will be like Him. Let's pray. Abba Father, as we look at what you have had Isaiah write in these verses, it is awesome to see what he describes in his vision. Your majesty and your throne room, the awesomeness of that one seraph whose voice shook the foundations of heaven, and yet, while for Isaiah it was a scene of great fear and trepidation, it is for us who are in Christ the place we call home. It is the place where we have our citizenship and which we long to enter after our sojourning here. We know there will come a day when we will be home. And so we thank you, Father, for this hope. And we pray that today might be the day when we hear you call, come up here, so that we might see you face to face. We might finally be free from sin's presence. In the meantime, Father, help us to understand who we are in Christ so that we might see our condition and move into the direction of our right now position. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. I'm sorry I went over just a bit. You're dismissed. Enjoy.